One, two, one, two, three, four. It's Paul Gilbert, and welcome to my guitar instructional DVD for my new album called Vibrato. And uh, I'm going to be going through all my new original tunes and showing you my guitar secrets for how to play these songs, uh, some equipment advice, what kind of pedals and guitars I'm using, songwriting concepts, all kinds of things that I use to make uh, for this record and the guitar inspirations that I had. So pick up your guitar, tune up, and get ready to explore the songs on my brand new album, Vibrato. All right, and uh, if you've got a vibrato bar, it's even better. Or use your fingers. We're gonna do some vibrato, we're gonna bend those strings, we're gonna play some scales. All right, come along with me, we'll have a wonderful time. Thank you so much, rock and roll. One, two, three! Couldn't sleep through the heat Felt the daylight through the sheets Plus I need to get up Catch my enemies and put them all in jail all right i put a whammy bar back on my guitar and i'm very excited about it so i was inspired to write this song called in jail which has a lot of whammy and it's probably the simplest whammy lick that you could ever do i'm just hitting a harmonic and then having a good time with pressing that whammy bar down so I'm going to begin at the beginning for the beginners, and that is these four chromatic notes starting on C sharp. I'm using an octave divider to give it a big low bassy. Oh, that sounds big. And then I'm just going up chromatically, and then hitting the open A. And then we've got our uh, G harmonic. And the same thing happens, a string lower on the low E string, starting on G-sharp. This time the harmonic on D. All right, so that's a very simple riff, a lot of fun to play, and I think you got it. Now for the intermediate players, I'm going to give you the next part, which is a variation of that, but this time I'm playing it in the key of F-sharp natural minor. So I'm going... That's a more dark sounding kind of scale there. And I'm hitting that high bar with my pinky on the fifth fret. And because it's a chord, right there I'm turning my octave pedal off because it, the octave pedals really prefer to have single notes to deal with. If you put a chord through an octave pedal, it can get a little ugly. So right there, at the same time I hit this, I click the octave pedal. And then I go into my high melody line. Oh, let me get that high note right. There we go. There it is. Begins with simple F sharp minor pentatonic. A little slide into it to make it stylistically uh, attractive. Slide up to the A and then slide up to the F sharp. So a lot of sliding. This makes it a little more vocally, and I'm actually singing with it, you know, catch my enemies and put them all in jail, yeah. So it's really matching what I'm doing with my voice. After that, I do a variation of that theme, but based on a different chord. So the notes are, let me do it with my octave pedal. All 
All right, so what is the chord that I'm basing this around? Let me see if I'm going. Right there. No, no. But then that's a D, like a D7. And after that, I do a, a G7 with a sus in it. And I'm trying to outline that sound. So that's where those notes came from. I'm just thinking first of the chord sound, then of the single notes to outline it and give it the same kind of flavor. And at the very end, I do a, a, a sus with an E minor seventh chord. So that's where the last, the last thing comes from. So really as a composer, I was thinking a lot of in terms of chords, before I even got to the solos. But uh, I hope you enjoy playing that part. All right, so for you advanced players, we're gonna go straight to the solo. There's two chords. The first chord is an A13. Sounds and looks like that. It's a, a bar with your third finger, seventh fret. And then we're gonna play, uh, what is that? A C sharp with our second finger. And we're gonna play a G with our first finger. Now I'm gonna use my thumb to play the low root. Nice jazzy sounding chord. The next chord is easy because all we have to do is move up our chord a half step and change the bass note from A to E. So basically it's just this chord going back and forth a half step with the bass note changing from A to E. So that's the basis of the rhythm. Now for the solo, here's what I want you to try. Uh, I think every advanced guitar player has some vocabulary in playing blues. And then I'm gonna play basically kind of a major blues over the, over the one chord, over the A13. So this sort of thing. Those kind of licks, where a lot of the uh, major third and minor third combined. That's a big part of it. Also, the combining the, uh, the what is it called? The, the major sixth. That's a nice sound in there too. So I'm, I'm going really fast because I want to get to the next part. And the next part, I'm going to try to play over this E7 sharp nine dominant thir or flat 13 chord. Let me say that again. E7 sharp nine flat 13. Yeah, it's a crazy thing, but I've got an easy scale, or I guess in this case it would be an arpeggio, to play over this. It's got five notes, and I'm going to show you what they are. Are you ready? Here they are. It's uh, going to be G and G sharp. Then we're going to play C, D, and E. So it's two notes on a string, then three notes on a string. We're going to do the same thing an octave higher now. We're going to start on this G, and do the same thing. G and G sharp and C, D, E. And again, up an octave, starting on the G. Same thing, two notes on a string. And C, D, E. So really we're just repeating those five notes. In three different places. So you only have to learn five notes, you only have to learn one uh, shape to visualize. And you just move it around in octaves. sounds really nice over that long E7 chord. All right, so let me show you how you might go between the two to have uh, to outline that. So I'll play a little bit of the rhythm first, like. So I hope you could hear how my solo was taking it through the A13, 
through that A7 sharp 9 flat 13 chord. All right, so there's some good things for you for the song In Jail. And uh, the last thing I should give you for you advanced players is this crazy lick that I did at the end, which is an A minor 7 string skipping lick. Maybe you've seen it before, but if you haven't, it's a really good one. And what the heck is going on there? It's three notes per string. Those notes are A, G, and E. Pretty big stretch, but you can do it. It's up high, so the frets are closer together. Then we go to the, the G string and play three more notes. Those are C, A, and, and uh, G. So we have three three-note patterns. One, two, three. One, two, three. Not playing the B string at all. That's why we're skipping a string. Then we have one low note, an extra bonus low note, which is a C note. Right there with your third finger. And if you want to get really crazy, you can reach up with this hand and grab the high C. And if you want to get even crazier, you can slide all the way up to the 24th fret on that high E and slide back down. So let's try that slow. I suppose the one other secret in that is because I'm doing some tapping, I have to do a little bit of uh, sort of a, a magic trick with my pick. So I temporarily, let's see, I, temp oh, I guess I put it between my second and finger and thumb while I'm doing that, and then I'll put it back to normal. So let's see, I guess it goes between two fingers and one finger, and two fingers and one finger. That's sort of the I sort of just take it on or off, so it's always consistently being held by the second finger, while this one occasionally jumps out to get that extra tapping thing. All right. A nice sound at the end of the song, and uh, enjoy in jail. <laughs> This is a song called Rain and Thunder and Lightning. And I'm going to show you a thing if you're a beginner and a thing if you're an intermediate player and a thing if you're an advanced player. So at the beginning part, I want to do the main riff. The All right, you've got it in your head now. Now, this is in 5-4, so it's going like... One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. But I don't think you should have to count it. I think you can feel it. It just goes. That's easier to me than counting to five. So let's look how to play it. It's basically just a pentatonic scale in G minor. And within those notes, I'm doing this pattern. Let's just do that much. A little vibrato at the beginning to make it cool. And at the end, I do a quick pentatonic run using those four notes. Uh, to make it easier and to make it sound better or smoother, I'm using a pull-off right there. Just picking a downstroke doing a pull-off, and then I'm picking the last two notes, like that. So that gets put into the end. Let's slow it way down. Three, four. All right. 
This is a really good exercise for your pinky because it's part of the fast lick to use your pinky and to throw it in there. But the nice thing about this, it's up fairly high on the neck. We're up the, we're in tenth position. So the frets are closer together, so you, even if you've got smaller hands, your pinky should be able to reach out and get that. All right. So for, your, for you intermediate players out there, I'm going to give you some arpeggios to work on. And they sound like this. It's actually going to start off with uh, the B flat major. And you can hear each arpeggio outlining a chord. The first chord is B flat major. The second chord is an F major, but with a third in the bass. One, two, three, that's how you know it's a third, you just count up a scale. For that, the arpeggio I'm going to play is this one. Now there's two ways you could play this. One is to pick every note. which I think works pretty well at that tempo. But this song's pretty quick. Because it's quick, I decided to make it easier on myself and to do more hammer-ons. So I'm doing an upstroke and a hammer-on. And that second note is coming with the power of my pinky thwapping down. I don't know if thwap is a word, but it's onomatopoeia for when your finger goes thwap and gets that note. And then followed by the low F, string skipping to the G string. Same technique for the first one. Also getting our, a sort of a mini thwap, because we don't have to stretch as far. Then we have this one here. Our next chord is an E flat. It looks like an E flat power chord, but then it has the ninth on top. So I tried to play that same note in the solo. And then the last one is a C minor. And I just ended with a bend. So let's put these all together. We go one, two, three, two, two, three. It's going to be a great exercise for you. Now, for the advanced players out there, let's take a look at the augmented chord at the end of the song. This one's crazy. It's uh, an arpeggio based on D augmented. Here's a D augmented chord. And the notes in that chord are very similar to the actual chord that I'm playing. And what is that thing? That's a D7 sharp 9 flat 13. It takes my brain, it's more difficult to say that thing than it is to play it. It's not bad to play it. But let's play the augmented arpeggio. That's going to outline that. Now this is simpler than it looks. It's just three notes. And those three notes are, and I'm going to start from the top, which is B flat, F sharp, and D. And I don't know, I might be saying the notes wrong, it might be an A sharp. That might make more, more sense to keep it with all sharps. So let's do A sharp, F sharp, and D. Three notes. A little bit of a stretch. We've got this, but it's up high on the neck, so you should be able to do that with your pinky. Hammer ons and pull offs again. I'm, I'm not picking every note. That makes it easier and smoother. Uh, now, here's the easy part. Is we basically know the lick now. All we're doing is we're going to move it to a different octave. And when we do that, the shape is going to stay exactly the same. The notes are the same, just an octave lower. And a good way to navigate this is to concentrate on where your pinky is going. And again, we're starting on that A sharp. And we're going to go down to the next A sharp. It's an octave lower, but the same sound. You can even practice just jumping octaves with your pinky. Get those three A sharps. And just add the other notes on now. There we 
we go. Three of the same identical shapes, identical notes. Now the trick is, of course, your hand has to has to do pretty big position shifts. You have to go from 14th position, shift down to ninth, or that's uh, what is it, 11th position, and shift down oh, again to ninth. So it's these quick shifts, but you know, if you watch any good punk rock guitar player, you know, there's shifting in that too. So this is not really a difficult thing. You just have to uh, do the same punk rock shifts, but this time with some notes attached to it. Now right there I did one little thing where I cheated to get an extra note, and I really didn't cheat, I just used a, a note that sounds good and made it a little easier to play this. And what is that note? It's actually a note that's in there already. This note, the D, but I found it in a different place. I found it over here on the high E string. The reason I like it there as well is that if we do our middle arpeggio on the two middle strings, when we go back up, we can get that note there as well as here. Two different options, and I like those options because with this one, I don't have to shift any position. I sort of stay in that in this area. Where if I shift all the way up here to get those three, it's a bigger hand move. So let me alternate between those two. The first one I'm going to just do with a single D note as an end. Now the, the, the alternative to that is to go all the way back up to this D here. Shift up, there's our D. And this one gives us the option of playing the additional three notes. All right, so I'll go between those two, the one and the three. And I'll go back and forth, and it kind of makes a cool pattern. distortion on that, have some fun with it. All right, now we're starting to make this arpeggio work. Let's take a look at the bottom octave and th throw that in as well. with a high D note. All right, and then back to our riff. Vibrato, and it's in the key of B flat, which is a challenging key to play, but that's what fit my voice, and I wanted to sing along with it, so I picked that key. And it's a pretty simple riff. It goes one, two. So the notes aren't complicated. It's just uh, what are what are they? In B flat, we've got uh, A flat, B flat, and that low octave. I guess we've got the minor third as well, which is, what is that, a D-flat. But the thing that makes it cool is the rhythm. And first of all, I want you to listen to the fact that it starts on the and of two. So if I count one, two, three, four, one, or let me count with the ands. One and two and three and four and one and two and. That's where it starts. 
one and two and three and four and one and two and so here we go one and two and three and four and one and two so it starts in kind of an odd place and maybe the first time that you listen to the song because I don't count it you might go, man, where, I can't really tell where one is, and then the band comes in, and you go, ooh, now I get it. So that's always a fun thing to do, is to start on sort of an offbeat, syncopated accent, and then when the, when the drums kick in, the listener knows what's going on. So that's what I did in this riff, and uh, let's look at what happens. If you're a beginner, uh, I'm doing alternate picking... It's a sort of a medium tempo shuffle. So instead of just doing straight uh, 16th notes, I'm shuffling it like. So that's a really uh, musical and, and, and groovy feel to develop with your alternate picking. So that's how it begins. Then I add some notes from the pentatonic scale that we've already talked about. All right, so that was just the seed of the idea. I came up with some lyrics for it. And then to expand more on it, I changed the bottom bass note. And that sort of creates chord changes in the head of the listener. So it began with the root, which is B flat, one, two. All right, so you're thinking B flat, but then... I threw in that G. And even though that's a G, it's actually the first inversion of an E flat chord. So if I play an E flat, like this E flat seven, the third step, one, two, three, is a G. So that's kind of what I'm making the listener here. Even though uh, it, I'm playing the G note, it's actually the third step of that E flat chord. So really, the underlying harmony is like that's sort of a like a B, B flat minor, and then the next chord would be an E flat seven. But I've got the third in the bass. All right, so that's uh, that's where that note came from. The next note is F sharp. All right, and that let's see what that is. Uh, that would be like an F sharp major, but it has the sound of Lydian hidden inside it. Because if I wanted to play a scale based on that, that's the sound I'm going for, which has the sharp four. It's kind of a, a, a note that makes your teeth do this. So that's, uh, that's what I like about the sound of that F-sharp major. It has that sharp four hidden inside it. Now, 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 now. All right, so that's the places that I take the riff by using those ending notes. Payoff, which is of course the vibrato note. And the song is called Vibrato, so this is an important part of the song. And I used all four fingers, all four of them, to bend that note up with as much power and strength as I could. All right, now a lot of guitar players tend to use three fingers. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that, but I decided to, to try to use all four, and it really gives you a lot of power. It also gives you a lot of space for your calluses. You, got, you sort of construct one big giant finger that allows you to, to bend that out for a long time without any pain or, uh, or blood or agony. It just feels good. The one other trick that I did is when you're shaking a string around that much, it can cause the other strings to make noise. And sometimes those noises can be cool too. You just sort of have to see, see if you like it or not. But uh, what I did was occasionally I would take my right hand and I would grab 
the two strings next to that string. And I would also use the side of my thumb to hit these strings so they won't ring out. And that way I can, I can have a lot of distortion and I'll still only hear the one string that I want to hear. And when I recorded this, I was right in front of some really loud amps. So uh, I got a lot of sustain. It would, it would go really as, as for as long as I could hold it. I could have that note happening. And uh, <laughs> when we finished the song, my, uh, uh, Thomas, the, the drummer, said, man, you know, that looks like so much fun. You know, that makes me wish I was a guitar player. So uh, I hope everybody wishes they're a guitar player when they hear. <laughs> And that's just the most fun thing to do with an electric guitar is to shake that note around. All right, so if you're a beginner, I think the place to start is to be really aware of starting on the and of two. This can, can be a tricky place to start, so let's try it. I'm going to count to four, and I'm going to keep counting, and right after I, I count to two, we'll, we'll start the riff. So if I go one, two, three, four, one, two. One. Two. One, two. There we go, you got it. All right, so if you're an intermediate player, we gotta get into these bends. And again, the four finger bend is what I recommend. And one thing you can listen to is the speed of your vibrato. You know, right there, I was doing it pretty quickly. You know, it's like, whoa, 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 yeah, about that speed. But also practice slowing it down. Let's try a much slower vibrato. Now, because I'm not running really loud amps right now, it's not sustaining as much, but you can still hear, hear the, uh, the tempo. Da, 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 or the same. All right, and I ended it with some fast stuff. It's nice to be able to do both speeds. You know, do the middle, uh, or do the beginning slow, and then end it fast. Or we can do it really slow. Let's try, let's see. All right, so there's some nice things to try. Let's see how fast I can get it. If we just went really fast, manic vibrato. That's about as quick as I can get it. Let me show you one more thing with the vibrato, and that is that the motion is really being generated by what's going on with my wrist. It's not my fingers pushing. My fingers aren't really moving. They're kind of locked into place, and then my wrist is moving back and forth. So I'm going to angle the guitar this way, and you can have a look at what the wrist is doing. players, let's get to the solo. And the solo goes through some chord changes. Like I described earlier, it starts off with uh, B flat minor, and for that you could do pentatonic. And I'm not going to show you too many specific things, I just want to show you the general harmonies. So, because uh, if you're an advanced player, you know some pentatonic. The other thing besides the notes is the rhythm. I'm trying to stay, stay within that shuffle groove, you know. All 
Uh, so you can hear that. One, I will we'll show you one quick lick that, that's sort of nice for doing that. Because when you think of that rhythm, da, 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 your first impression might be like, that's difficult because it requires a lot of notes. Like you have to go. But you can cut down the amount of notes and make it simpler and still sound really good by doing a phrase like this, like one, two, three, four. That still gives that shuffle sound, and I'm only using three notes. It's just the third, which I'm playing twice in the shuffle groove, and then I did two descending notes in the pentatonic scale, the root and the seventh. So I went. Something, something like that. You can improvise with it, but that's, I'm doing a pattern similar to that. One, two, three, four. I threw in a little extra bend there. Well, that's a, a great way to get a shuffle feel without having to have a ton of notes. All right. So the next part of it is when it goes to the E flat seven with that G in the bass. For that, I'm gonna go from my kind of strict pentatonic soloing to more of a Dorian sound, because the Dorian scale in B flat has that G note as the, really the character note of the mode. And that's gonna outline that bass move perfectly. So if I go, uh, let me see, one, two. Pentatonic. That note in Dorian just really gets the sound that I want. Then the next one. For the F sharp Lydian, let's play an F sharp Lydian. Now the trick is, I might not have that much time, because these chords go by pretty quickly. So I really want to pick out the important notes of F-sharp Lydian, and what are those? I think my favorite are... That, those are the notes that make Lydian sound like Lydian. It's the root, major third, sharp four, and the five. No, 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 no. And I want to learn that in three octaves. Really gives the sound of that of that mode without having to play all the notes. So you can you can get that to happen pretty quickly in just a short phrase using those notes. Yeah, because you might not have time to whip through the whole scale when it's going by like that. Let me do it in context and demonstrate. One, two. So that gives you a way to solo over those changes. And that is uh, the song Vibrato. And whether you play this song or whether you play any song, please take advantage of the fact that you are an electric guitar player and find all the places that you can to bend. That's what I did at the very end of the song. I uh, repeated the line, and in each hole, I did a different place to bend. It's so like this. One, two. <laughs>
right, here's some licks from a song called Put It On The Char. And I'm gonna give you something first for the beginners. And this is uh, the main riff that... <laughs> All right, so the notes themselves are pretty simple. It's all out of E minor pentatonic on the lower strings. But the tricky part, and it's worth doing this tricky part, is the chickas. I'm doing these little scratchy sounds by muting out the note with my left hand and putting that percussively in between the notes. So it's like da da chicka. And you can watch how my left hand is shifting to block out that note so it doesn't ring out. So my, my pinky comes over just to make sure everything is blocked out there. My whole hand kind of flattens out over the string, so nothing, even if I hit all of them, there's no, there's no sound, as opposed to this. You know, I don't want all that ringing out, so I just want to control it, nice, smooth chicka. And I'm just doing it on the single string, on the A string. But that makes it so groovy if you put those in between. Let me do it real slow so you can hear. Three, four. All right, you can do this trick, trick. Now let's speed it up a little bit. One, two, three, four. That's going to make it cool. One, two, three. I should mention real quick that for most of this song, I'm using an octave divider. I'll play without it for a second, in case you don't have one. You just hear it sounds with a sort of a plain sound. One, two, three. It's still cool, but that octave divider makes it all beefy. So that's a good one. Let's see, for the inter intermediate players, I'm gonna give you uh, the fun part, the improvising part, where I just hit two big bonks and then play some licks in E in the middle. This is, first of all, just a great exercise because what I want you to think about is it's your job during that space in between the bonks to, with, using your guitar, you have to send the audience what the groove is. You know, even though you're playing a solo, I don't want you just to go whittly whittly. I want you to, you know, put some sort of rhythmic content in it. So, for example, if I go, that rhythmically was boom boom ba da 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 da. And you know, I went, and I can do other rhythms like, so I'm really trying to think like a drummer. Even the fast things. If I went, uh, let's see. That was doom do. do uh, uh, you know, it was still some rhythmic thing there. So uh, that's your job is, is to tell the audience in you know what the rhythm is, not just the notes. So uh, let me give you some of my favorite ones. If you can do that with bending, then you're really doing a good job. You know. That's cool. So let me give you my favorite bending lick that I've been working on. And this one, I'm going to bend up a half step from the C sharp. So from C sharp to D. And I'm going to drop the string. This is kind of crazy. Check this out. I'm going to go. And I'm just going to drop it. <laughs> Boop. Now, why would I do such a ridiculous thing as dropping the string? It's because I want to get to the next string. And I want to be able to come down on that one. So that's the cool thing is one string is going up in pitch and then you shift to the next string and it goes down. So it's like, you know, ba -boo, ba -boo. All right, now let me see if I can put that in time. Because like I said, I want to have rhythmic content. So I could go. So it'd be dum dum ba ba tick on Now, uh, that's, that's a slower bendy lick, but I should give you that real fast one that I showed earlier, which is just four notes out of pentatonic. But that's the typical way of playing that, with two notes on a string. And I changed it 
in order to be able to play it faster. And what I did is I took those same notes but stretched them out on a single string, those first three, and then the bottom note is there on the 12th fret using a lot of pull-offs here. So I'm just picking the first note with an upstroke and the last note with a down. Everything in between is pull-offs. Make sure when you play it slow that you listen for any string noise. Make sure that all those notes are nice and clean sounding and separate. And that's, I think because of the fingering, I can get that so much quicker than if I played it with a typical fingering, like this. That's pretty quick, but this one... You can really get that one moving. And again, this will fit rhythmically if I go... All right, so that's a great fast one for you. And that's definitely, that's getting close to advanced, but I think you can do it. For the advanced people out there, I'm going to give you the look at the end. This is uh, one that sounds like this. Again, my octave divider is making that sound really big. It's just five notes at the beginning with an open E string. Then I have F sharp, G sharp, and two notes on the A string, B and D. So first of all, just the fingering for this, that's an interesting fingering. It's actually the four notes that comprise a G sharp minor seven flat five arpeggio. Isn't that crazy? Uh, this is the, the G sharp minor seven flat five chord, which would be uh, And I'm taking the notes of that chord and putting them as close together as I can. And if you like to talk about music theory, basically that's a substitution for an E9 chord. All those notes, those big chunky notes, are inside this chord, and that's kind of the sound I'm going for. All right, so that's how I made that riff. After that, I just did a really fast scale in that same key, and it starts on G sharp. Three notes on a string. This is a nice, easy shape. Just a half step shape and a whole step shape. And I'm trying to get the scratchiest sound that I can out of my pick by picking lightly and using a pretty significant angle. Um, my pick is not flat, it's angled at about a 45 degree angle. But don't even worry how, about how it looks. Basically, use your ear to listen. Make sure you get that nice scratchy sound. All right, let's try it again. So you can use your ear to get that chick 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 chicka chicka chicka. All right. Well, that one that's a challenger. That we we did that super fast at the end of the song. And for the improvising over that I'll show you one cool scale that I used. Uh, it has some pedal tone licks in it. It sounds like this. Now, pedal tone is when you have one note at the bottom or top of something. In this case, it's a D note. And then I just I, I kept going back and forth between that and other notes. So you can hear that D is always on the bottom. The technique for this is outside picking. So the D note is always a downstroke. Every other note is always an up. So you can that's an easy way to remember it. It's always down on the D, up on everything else. And that sounds great over that E sound. And I did another version of that using the G sharp as the low pedal. This time it sounds like this. Oh, 
All right. These are really easy to visualize because the notes that you, basically your your first finger is playing that G sharp. Your other fingers are just doing this whole step shape. Very easy shape to visualize. Those are some great sounding notes to play over that. All right, so you got it. That's put it on the char. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. It's a blues about being a clam at the bottom of the ocean, which is how you can feel if you're a musician that's been in a dark studio for too long. And that was me, so I wrote this blues, and it made me feel much better. I love playing a blues. And uh, this one is in the key of D minor. And let's see, if you're a beginner blues player, I would say the D minor pentatonic scale is a great place to start. Almost every guitar player in the world knows that scale, and if you don't, you've got to learn that one. Let me play it really slowly again. All right, now we've got that scale, but what do we do with it? What I suggest to do in a nice slow blues like this is to actually sing small phrases and try to copy it with the notes in that scale, and lots of bending if you can. For example, if you go... Um, ba -ba -da -da -da. Very rhythmic. There's nothing really fast in here or that technically challenging, but it really gets you to know where those blues notes are, and you can, you can go right for them. So it, it took me a lot of practice to do that. Again, it's not as much technique practice as it is memorizing where those notes are. You know, there's a lot of good notes, you just have to know them in advance. So when I, if I sing, I can find it on the first try. And that's, that's not talent, that's work. That's, it's just working with that skill a lot and getting, just memorizing where the notes are. Uh, so if you're a beginner, that's a great place to start. And uh, let's see. Now, I played this, the really straight-ahead pentatonic scale at first. But there's a couple really common places to move that are connected to this. So the first one I'm going to show you is I'm going to take two important notes from the scale. The fifth. Uh, you can count it up. One, two, three, four, five. That's the one. the fifth. And the third, the minor third. You know, one, two, three. That's why it's the third. So those two notes together, the fifth and the third, we're going to play them as a chord. Now, by itself, that might be a little dissonant, but if you put the bass note in, you can hear how that makes a nice minor chord sound. So, and those notes are in the pentatonic scale, so we can use them as a solo, but I want to slide them up. 
and then slide back down. I use that a lot in the rhythm of the song. Now the main chord is a uh, D minor seventh chord. With a couple ways to play that. Right there I played it with the thumb and a bar with my first finger. Three notes on the same fret. But just as commonly I'll play it with my middle two fingers, the second finger on the bass note, and the third finger right there. So this is a great exercise. If you can just play a chord and play a short phrase that's sort of a, a singing type of phrase afterwards, it'll really improve your blues playing. And it's, it doesn't require a lot of technique. It just requires some, some uh, musical love of the blues. So three, four. Well, the bends in there, I, I have to show them to you because I think bends are so important. Up here I did a half step bend from the ninth to the third. Right here is the seventh to the root. Such nice sounds in this minor blues. All right, so there's a good place for you to start as, a, as for a beginner blues lick. Lots of pentatonic, lots of bending. slide there. This is all in uh, in the sort of D, D as in dog position of the, of the guitar. And the thing I'm going to give for you intermediate players is learning how to play D minor in a different part of the neck. And D is an interesting key because, you know, we're all guitar players and I think a lot of, we have, tend to have the same habits. I know I do. If I hear the key of D, my hand goes right there. That's where I see D. It's the easiest. But those notes exist in other places on the neck, and it took me a while to learn them, but I want to show you the ones that I think are really useful. First of all, just the straight pentatonic scale in the middle of the guitar here. Now that's a limited range. I'm not playing on all the strings. I'm just playing these middle notes. You can hear that's exactly the same notes as if I played the pentatonic scale up in this position. Same shape same sound, but a different location. And that will give you, eventually, a different range and, uh, and some other possibilities. So let's practice it here, just to get used to it, in fifth. One, two, three, four, five. Fifth position. And the same thing, I would practice this with your vocal melodies, like... Now right there, in order to copy my vocal line, I needed that little bend, like So I actually came out, because if I just hit the note like that, I can't bend it, so I want to go lower. And I wanted the strength of, I actually construct a giant finger by putting three of them together. And that gives me the strength to bend on the lower string. The lower strings can be tough to bend. So. That's a nice vocally lick. So I'm really getting used to this position of D by singing. And you know, I might not always get it, but if I don't, I can search for it. And that's, that's a great way to learn this scale. Now, maybe the most important note I want to show you that's connected to all this would be the, the third on top. So if I go... Uh, and why is this important? It's important for two reasons. One is it's a great sound. The third is a really powerful note in the blues and in all music. But the other thing is as a guitar player, you have to adjust your fingering to, to compensate for the way the B string is tuned. When you play that note up in your, our original uh, pentatonic shape, we get to stay on the same fret. Our first finger is always on that same fret. Isn't that nice and convenient? It is. But when we play it down here, we have to go to a different fret because of the way the guitar is tuned. So we can't go 
because that's the ninth. Ninth isn't a bad note, but I want the third. So I'm gonna bring my second finger in, which is kind of nice. I actually get two finger strength for, for bending if I want. So. And that's, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really get used to it by singing, like, that's the, that's the way you really get used to these scales. Now the final one I'm going to give you in this kind of position are the really low notes. Now I'm, I'm tuning in standard tuning, so I don't have a low D. If I go down and try to get an octave lower, I don't have it. E is my lowest note. But I do have the third, that F, down here. So that's kind of a cool note to play with if you go like... What a cool note to bend. A lot of good phrases down there. Right, some really cool sounds down there in the low part of the neck. And let's see, for you advanced players, I'm going to give you my advanced chords that happen later on in the song. Because I start with a D minor 7th. I stood there for a long time. And eventually, finally, I end up with a 4 chord, the G minor. And then I go back to the D minor. So everything about the blues here is normal so far. But then we hit an E major. And that's kind of unusual. This is actually like a two chord. And uh, what are we going to play over this E major? I'm going to play a couple things. I want to try this. First of all, an open E string. And I'm going to play a melody on the B string. And I can just improvise with those notes. The notes that I chose are out of the Phrygian dominant scale, which sounds complicated, but it's not really. It's just going to be E, the unison, F, Kind of dissonant, but mysterious sounding. G sharp, A, B, and C. All right, so. If D if you want. A little Spanish sounding. That's nice for an easy phrase. If you want to play something faster, you can play a three note per string for a G and dominant scale. Let me play that slowly first so you know where to put your fingers and we'll try it out. So here it is, Phrygian dominant in E. I'm going to start up on the high A. Three notes on a string. Okay, one more time. That's a lot of stuff to throw over this chord, and the chord actually doesn't last that long. So, you got to whatever you do, you got to do it quick. And then I go to a B flat major, which has a bit of a Lydian sound, and I think for a lot of the solos in this song, I played a major nine arpeggio. That's a nice sound too. Basically, it's just four notes. Kind of the uh, <laughs> useful sound. Then an up an octave, same fingering, same notes, and up an octave again. That's an easy way to visualize it. All right. And after that, I have an A sus, a uh, A seven sus actually. To play that, I got kind of an easy trick to play a power chord. And do the same thing on the middle strings. Just play them separately. And that's the exact notes of the chord. So isn't that cool? So let's do that in octaves. We'll play it first in the low octave. Then we'll go up an octave by starting on the A here. 
Same thing. All right, that's the sound of this chord. Then resolve down to the A7. And then that happens so fast that I'm just gonna go right back to my one chord. All right, so no matter if you're a beginner, intermediate or advanced, I think the most exciting part of this kind of uh, style is to try to play what you hear in your head. To tr uh, and a great way to practice that is to sing it first and play it second. So, you know. Really a fun exercise, very musical, and it's completely a different sound than if you just play scales up and down like an exercise. Very different emotion when you sing than when you play a scale up and down as an exercise. So I really want you to start singing like that. And uh, if you're embarrassed, of, if you don't feel confident as a singer, just wait, wait till nobody's around, or, or just do it quietly, falsetto. You go. <laughs> All right, I could do that all day, but I'm going to let you do it, and I'm going to uh, just play a little more blues for you, so you can uh, check out some ideas. One, two, three, two, two, three. <laughs> Approximation of the solo that I did in the song Atmosphere on the Moon. And this tune is crazy. It combines Philadelphia soul influences with uh, guitar shred. And I want to start at the beginning, and that is the chords. So let's look at the chorus. I think the chorus is the most interesting chords. And I'm going to turn on my compressor at a lower volume to clean up the sound a little bit, because these are complex chords. <laughs> If I use too much distortion, they're not going to come out. So uh, I'm going to play them. Let me play it first just to get it in your head. It'd be one, two, three, two, two.
there they are. Those are the chords. And I want to show them to you fairly quickly because I know you've got a rewind button or uh, you can go back and watch this again. So I'm just going to do each chord one note at a time. I'll tell you what it is and then I'll play it. Are you ready? Get your guitar out and we're going to play an A major 7th chord. Sounds like this. Then an F sharp minor seventh. Then a G major triad with A in the bass. Let's take another look at that one because my fingers are all sort of uh, scrunched up into one shape. So I'm going to take my third finger off and you can see those three notes of the G major triad. And my third finger reaches over and gets the bass note on A. That's the Philadelphia Soul chord right there. Then a regular A7. Using my thumb for the bass note. Then a D major 7th. D minor 7th. F sharp minor 7th. We've already done this one. Then a B minor 7th. And I just go between that and the F sharp minor over and over again. And the last one is a D major triad with E in the bass. You can either play the E open or reach up with your third finger and play it like that. It's kind of useful because later on we're going to be doing modulations and we have to move it up to F and F sharp. And so all these choruses get modulated up. So just when you think you know one, and the next time it comes around it's up a half step. That's a nice challenge in this tune. And uh, let's see, the next step for you intermediate players. Let's take a look at the intro solo where I played two chords, a B minor 7. I'll play the chord, the notes separately. All the notes are on one fret, but I'm managing to squeeze my two middle fingers onto that fret and play those notes. The next chord is an E dominant 9. also known as the funk chord. All right, so it's those two chords together. Sort of a slow 6-8 groove. And over that, you can play a B Dorian scale. And uh, by good fortune, the B Dorian scale over the B Those notes also sound good over the E. So you can, especially as you play faster, uh, the, the relationship between the notes and the chords uh, matters less and less as you play fast. So that's one of the reasons I'm playing quickly. It actually makes the phrasing easier if I just sort of you know, whiz through the notes. So that was a quick phrase there, and I don't think it would be useful for me to explain, you know, to, to slow that whole thing down, it's going to be impossible. So I just want to show you some small tips on where to begin in taking a scale shape and being able to go, you know, all the way through it. <laughs> That's a lot of fun, but it took a lot of practice to get there. I... Uh, the, the phrase I'm going to show you is this one. I'm just going to show you, because this is three notes per string, so I'm going to concentrate on using three notes per string. Let's take this, these three notes here. And that is C sharp, D, and E. And that's going to begin with an upstroke. And from there, I want to come back down with, with pull-offs. And then we're going to do one note 
on the lower string as an A note. So the picking is up for the first note and down for the last note. And I can't tell you how many hours I played that lick when I was a teenager. I really put a lot of time in to make that strong. It's very driven by the left hand. And that really is the motor uh, beneath all this fast stuff that I'm doing. As I get going, of course, I've been playing for decades now, so I've begun, my hand has invented variations. But I think that basic lick is a great place to start in getting through those string upper string scales. All right, now the last thing I want to look at is the solo. This one is in the key of B flat, crazy key, and uh, so that's why I overdubbed it. This is one of the few solos in the record that I actually overdubbed and didn't play live. And I, I did that because I took one look at B flat and went, I'm not ready to do this live. I need some practice. So uh, I tried to start off by imitating the uh, the vocal melody. So that's something like this. It's, you know, uh, da, 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 da. so it was like. Uh, <laughs> the next one. All right, there's a lot of stuff in there. Let me slow it down a little bit. So again, we're in B flat major, and I'm taking the, uh, the B flat major pentatonic scale as sort of my, my, uh, my main shape. You know, great notes to improvise with and they're, they're familiar shapes for guitar players and just about everybody's used pentatonic before so that's a nice comfortable place to start but then I do have some chord changes somehow I have to play over those and alter my shape a little bit and then the real big change is when I go to the that minor chord for that I just decided to take four notes that I knew would work and those four notes are these I'm playing them with tapping them so you can hear the chord at the same time. Let's play them uh, normally. There's two notes on a string. Sounds nice with that chord, so I tried to do different patterns with that. And it doesn't last long. Almost immediately, it's going to go to that G minor, G minor 7. To play that, with a solo, I did a G minor 9 arpeggio. This is, this is actually pretty easy to play, because it's only five notes. Here are the five notes. It'd be D, F, G, A, B flat. Two notes on a string, three notes on a string. One, two, one, two, three. Same thing up an octave. Same fingers, same notes, just an octave higher. Same shape, so your brain likes it. And then the same thing again, up an octave. All together. And that's a nice sound over that G minor chord. And then I got my big uh, bending nose. And there I just started playing fast again uh, using a B flat major scale. All 
it. So I should give you one more lick to work on there, and I'm going to give you this picking lick where we're let's just practice doing a three note per string uh, B flat major scale way up high. But I'm going to start it on the A. There we go. That way when we end, we still have room. We don't run out of frets. So... This way I can get a nice staccato picking sound. That I had to, I must admit, I had to do a couple takes to get it right. It takes some practice. I'm going to turn up my compressor, see if that helps me out. All right, so. Uh... of the solo and the song of Atmosphere on the Moon. One, two, three, go! <laughs> It's the pronghorn, and this one is in the key of F sharp. And for you beginners, I'm going to start you off with a picking lick that is a single note. It's a single F sharp on the A string, and this is a great uh, way to get into that scratchy sound because I'm doing a, a kind of a quick triplet. I'm going one two three one two three one two three one two three triplet triplet. Like that. And it requires a fairly precise technique. I'm playing, you know, on that one string, trying to get it really clean, and I'm not hitting it very hard. Really, my goal is to get that nice scratchy sound, and if I hit it too hard, then I get more note. That's a nice note, but I want to get that, that's the whole fun of picking is to get that scratchy sound. So I'm picking really light, and I'm turning on a little more distortion, make that come out a little more. And I'm also using an octave divider to beef that up. So that's where the sound is coming from. And uh, when you practice that, I would be aware of a couple things. Just be real aware of the time. Try to transmit the, uh, the beat through your guitar. Your guitar is the, uh, your communication instrument to communicate that tempo to the listener. So you want to go... what the, 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 what the, 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 the. Right, that's a great technique to build. And let's see, the next thing is uh, for you intermediate players, I'm gonna, let's just keep on continuing the riff. Uh, we'll begin with that. But then we do this like where we do a three note chromatic phrase, E, F sharp, or I'm sorry, E, F, and F sharp. And then we reach down and get the low A sharp. Now I want to see what kind of stroke that is, because this is the first time when we've had to go from one string to the other. So if I start with alternate picking, which I am, it's actually an upstroke there. And that's good to make take notice of, is when you do that note, that shift to the A sharp, or, that's an up. So let's practice that a couple times. One, two, three, four. <laughs> All right, now as soon as we do that, we've actually got a big jump up to this 
this it's from a pretty far jump. I'm going all the way up to the F sharp on the seventh fret of the B string. So now let's see what this stroke is. If I go, it's actually another upstroke. That's crazy. I'm doing two quick upstrokes in a row, but uh, that's how I do it. So that's how I'm going to explain it to you. Let's let's have a look at it again. I'll do it slower. One, two, three, four. There it is. After that, I've got three chromatic notes on the low E string. A nice little syncopated rhythm. B, C, and C sharp. So it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. Oh, then I can start on the right note. One, two, three, four. show you my secret chord. Really quickly, I want to show you how I built the chord. It's actually an, a D sharp major chord with a sus. Sus stands for suspended, and I am suspending in the air that note there. What is that? That's a, a, uh, that's a G, and I'm lifting it up to a G sharp. That's a pretty common guitar chord. The uncommon thing now is I'm going to change the bass note. Instead of using D sharp as the bass, I'm going to use C, and that's going to require me to refinger the chord and use my thumb on the C. So that's the chord there. And I'm throwing it in in kind of an odd place in the context of the, of the key, because we're in F sharp. So that, to me, that sounds so crazy that I wanted to stay on it a little bit longer. So I actually sustained that for two beats. So just give you a chance to taste the flavor of that chord. So I go. Little whammy bar action, and uh, that's the main riff. All right, so for you advanced players out there, I want to look at a four note phrase that I threw in in the B section, or the, the uh, yeah, the B section. It, again, it starts out in F sharp, I'm doing the syncopated, very simple riff, three, four. But what's that picking thing at the end? It's fours, I'm doing four notes. One, two, three, four. The octave divider on again. And let's see what those are. We're doing D sharp, E, and F sharp, all on one string. Alternate picking, up, down, or I'm sorry, down, up, down, up. And from there, I'm hitting a note on the D string with my pinkies. This is a nice little pinky jump with this finger. So really look at how my pinky is handling that. I'm not barring, I'm actually jumping the finger from string to string. So there it's moving like that. That's great training for your pinky. And the next note, we're going to actually repeat the same riff, but this time we're going to end with an A note. That's going to use your second finger. And I'm just going to go back and forth between the two. Then I'll join them up so there's no space in between. A lot of muting with this hand so it makes the notes nice and short and staccato. Now these are fours, but I'm actually playing them as triplets. So let me play it in the context of the phrase, and you can hear how they sound like triple, a triple, a triple, a triple. <laughs> Now the end is very simple. I just do one more ending, same beginning, but this time I go to the low B. And then slide down to the A. So the whole thing's slow. Three, four. Wow. 
So there's some strange accents in there, but it all comes back to land on the one. It's a nice 4-4 phrase, nothing strange about it, just some accents that are a little unexpected because you're putting a four phrase into a three rhythm. <laughs> From there, it just modulates up a whole step. And modulates up another whole step. But this time, I extend that fast picking phrase, and I got a lot of notes on the lower two strings. Nice big chunky sounding strings. the heck was going on there. Basically, these are all fours. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Each time, I'm changing the shape so the notes fit inside. Let's see, what is this? I'm trying to play over the sound of a D sharp seven chord. That's the chord sound I want. So I just picked a scale that fits with that. And that, in this case, believe it or not, is D sharp mixolydian. Woo! D sharp mixolydian. We're actually using that crazy thing for this song. And here are the notes. Oh, I'm sorry, I screwed that one up. It's a whole step. There we go. And then this one I continue all the way up. All right, so that's it. And uh, there's a speed up point because I basically start off as triplets. But then as soon as I get to the C note, I sort of uh, pull it into uh, hyperspeed and go to 16th notes. So right, right, right at the C. So let's hear this in context. I just wanted to slow it down so you can find what the notes are. And uh, you're an advanced player, so you've probably done D sharp mixolydian before. And if, if not, that's what it was. All right, now let me, let me put it in context of the riff and so you can see how it comes in and fits with the beat of this. So if I'm going from the B flat, one, two, buckle my shoe. And it ends right on the one, or after that bend. Now, I'm gonna go back to an E7 and F7 and then back to our You gotta make a good guitar face when you play that chord. Let me play without the octave divider so it's nice and beautiful sounding. And the last thing I'll tell you is for the, uh, maybe for the intermediate players, let's look at the solo, which is in, uh, it's all dominant chords, but it's shifting to different keys. I begin with an A7, and then go to F sharp 7. And just back and forth, and the, the groove is that uh, sort of bouncy shuffle. That kind of groove. So what are we going to play there? I think for the A, I play kind of a major blues. I use a lot of both thirds, like... Now this is, this is really guitar vocabulary. This is the kind of licks that guitar players usually play. So I'm thinking you already have some experience in this if you're an intermediate player. But just in case, I'm going to give you a couple licks. Let's try this one. Let's do uh, a Dorian bend. That's a really good bend to have. And then let's go down like that. So we'll do uh, that little pull off. And then both thirds, minor third and major third together, to the root. That's a nice shuffly phrase that'll give, go well over, over your A7 chords. A lot of stuff like that in there. But what happens when I go to the F sharp? I could just take it down and do the same like three frets lower. But to, it's, a lot of times it's cool to find this different key, but in the same part of the neck, so we don't have to keep shifting our hand back and forth. So to play F sharp seven in this area, I'm going to play this scale. I'm just going to play it uh, through it once to get the sound in your, in your head. Here's the chord. And here's the scale. So 
So what is that? That's actually all the notes out of an F sharp dominant 13. Except for the root. Your bass player can play the root. And uh, you're, you're very hip by not, by not playing it in your solo. So all this is shape-wise, it's so easy. I've, I've, uh, I've probably mentioned this in other lessons as well, but just picture a B-flat minor pentatonic scale. Very easy scale to, for guitar players. Everybody knows this one. But you got to change one note. And here's the note you change. Instead of playing that F, lower that down to an E. So that sounds nice over this. You can hear how those match up. All right, and then when we get to the bottom of the scale, we're going to do the same thing when we get to what would be the F note. We want to change that to the E. So it looks like this. There we go. You can hear how that sounds good. That note's actually in the F sharp chord. So that way, we can stay in the this, this same position and play over those two changes. The A7. Oh, Alright, that's a nice way to play over those two. That'll get you started. Uh, in the rest of the solo, I, I do spend a long time in B7. And at the end, do an altered C sharp 7. All right. All right, that is the pronghorn. Thank you so much for listening to those ideas. Check them out and uh, rock and roll. It's time to talk about gear. And I had a really good time with the equipment that I used on this album. The guitars, first of all, I kept accurate to the song with the lessons. So in other words, if I gave a lesson with a particular guitar, that's the guitar that I used on the song. And uh, for pedals, let's get to that right now. Now, first of all, usually on my pedal board, I use a pedal tuner. But on this album, I actually use this little guy that's on the end of my headstock. And uh, it's, a, it's a Korg pitch clip. I just hit a note, and it goes, uh, I can tell if it's in tune or not. In this case, it's perfectly in tune. All right, so that is how I stay in tune. And then on the pedal board, let's see what we got. I'm going to start here uh, with the first pedal, which is an Empress Compressor. And first of all, it's got really cool lights. Check out these lights. Oh, I'm going to turn it on. There we go. And you can hear the difference when I play without it. I've got my amp set up to be relatively clean. But when I turn it on, it gives me a little more boost and makes the guitar more sensitive. So I don't have to hit as hard. I can play a little more light. a little bit easier to play, makes the clean things come out really nice. I dig that compressor. All right, the next one is the Octron uh, by Fox Rocks. This is a discovery I made recently. It's just a really nice sounding octave pedal where it gives me a, a potentially either a higher or lower octave, but I'm using the, uh, the lower octave there mostly. You can hear the difference without it. But then it suddenly it sounds like a bass player joined the band. So even when I play solos, it just thickens it up. Because without it, with it. Especially on those lower riffs, that's such a nice sound. That's a really great sounding octave pedal. 
And actually having a compressor before it makes it trigger even, even more accurately and just sounds great. <laughs> So that's a nice pair of those two. All right, from there, let's go to the Fuzz Universe. This is a very reliable pedal I use all the time. And it's just a, a great overdrive pedal with two sides. Thrust one is uh, straight distortion. A little boost on there as well. And then thrust two is even more of a boost. So if you've got a tube amp, which is what I'm using, it really drives it, and you get more distortion of that. Of course, if you've got a giant foot like I do, you can get both of them at the same time. If I really want to get crazy, I can put the compressor on and these and really have a lot of sustain. So those are them, and then let's continue on. The next one, you might not notice it, but I have a splitter that's on its side here. It's actually a Laylee splitter, and it says PG on it, which does not, in this case, mean Paul Gilbert. It means I've got a phase button and a ground lift, and that's why I put a P and a G. I just wrote that on there with, with a silver paint pen, so I know which one is which. And that can be really helpful to have those buttons when you've got a two amp setup, which I do now. And I split it so I can use two MXR Phase 90s. And I love this sound. When I put them both on, here's without it. But with it. Ooh, listen to that. That's a beautiful sound. Put the compressor on. Really big stereo sound. And uh, combine that with the compressor and the octave pedal and a little bit of Fuzz Universe and we get an amazing tone. All right, so those are my tone secrets. In addition to that, on some of the tunes, I also use the Tube Screamer just as uh, another kind of tone. I, I love the Fuzz Universe, but I love the Tube Screamer as well. So sometimes I'm just in a different mood, so I try a different distortion pedal. And the uh, Empress Para EQ is a very useful equalizer that I kind of use to make a single coil sound more like a humbucker. And my Fireman guitars, most of them have single coils, so occasionally I'll thicken it up a little bit if I want to have more of a humbucker sound for a certain part of the song. And uh, these are the main pedals I've used for the whole record. So uh, it's all powered by a uh, Voodoo Labs Pedal Power Plus. I've got, I've got it labeled with a giant 120 volt sticker because uh, whenever I travel to other countries, it usually accidentally gets plugged in the wrong power and, and, and blows up. And I don't want that to happen. So I make it very obvious what uh, voltage needs to be plugged into that. And that's it. It's a lot of Velcro, and it's a lot of uh, plywood, and all my favorite sounds right there on my pedal board. Thanks. Thank you very much. One, two, three, four. <laughs>you so much for coming along with me on this guitar journey through the songs of the album vibrato i hope you had a great time i had a fantastic time i'd like to thank everybody who played in my band kelly lemieux on bass and thomas lang on drums and emmy gilbert on keyboards did a fantastic job we had an amazing time making this record almost the whole thing is live in the studio 
and uh, I hope that uh, you can use these ideas for your own music, whether it be specific things or just inspiration from seeing another musician who's excited about what they do. And that's it. So uh, keep on playing your guitar. Learn one new thing every day. That's my uh, only real secret I have. Is if, if you learn one new thing, it can be a chord, scale, part of a song. It's one thing to add on to your pile of knowledge. One more musical tool to put in your musical toolbox. You do one every day. At the end of a year, it's going to add up to a lot. And uh, you'll have all kinds of good tools to make any kind of music you want to make. All right, that's it. This is Paul Gilbert. We'll see you again. Rock and roll, and uh, see you on the road. All right. All right, it's time to make one of my favorite things in the world, gyoza. And I learned to make these even before I knew they were called gyoza. Back then I just called them Chinese dumplings, but now I know the proper name. And in Japan that's kabetsu, I think. My memory serves me. Okay, now we need to make this small, so... Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, let's scoop that into the bowl. Don't have to be careful with it. If you're too careful, it takes too long. All right, so we've done it. We've got a big bowl of cabbage, so uh, we're going to boil that. And uh, let me get some water boiling. Get this, get this cooking. All right, now while that's heating up, let's chop the onions. Good, one mighty chop. There we go. And I'm under under pressure, so being filmed. But I'm gonna do some good chopping. All right, I decided I want these onions a little bit smaller, so I'm gonna use a chopping technique. I don't know if, if anybody else in the world does this, but I just sort of hold the end of the knife, and then with the other end, come down and sort of. And I try not to do that. <laughs> but basically. There we go, making these nice and small. All right, so let's put those in the bowl and we'll be ready for our next step. I've got some uh, chicken breasts and maybe I'll cut it up a little bit just to make it, make it sort of a good size to fit in there. You know, the size of your, uh, what's something this? What's something that's that size? The size of a, a big... <laughs> a size of this. That's how big you want. And here's it's going to be exciting. We get to make a noise. I'm going to put it on chop. Oh, don't. There we go. And let's put this in this bowl here. All right, the water's boiling. Time to boil the cabbage. There it is, a healthy boil. Carefully put it in here so you don't splash yourself with boiling water. And how long should we boil this? I mean, it, it, as you wash it, it turns like a sort of a more intense shade of green. It's green tinted 60s cabbage. In the meantime, I've got to be able to drain it, so I need something to drain this with. And I'm going to use. All right, and I'll keep in mind, this is not, it's, it's not a calendar, it's a colander. It's, uh, it, took me, it took me years to figure that out. They're actually two different words. And let's see, for that amount of chicken, maybe, yeah, that's good. I'll, I'll do about, about that much. I don't really measure, I just sort of do it until I go like, well, Looks delicious. I'll, I'll do that. I can add more later if I need to. All right, I think we're ready. The, the two minutes have passed. Careful not to spill the boiling water all over yourself. And woohoo! Okay, 
in it goes. Drained cabbage, oh, that's very nice. Now, I want to squeeze the water out of this. And there's a couple ways to do it. And I think, how am I going to do that? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invent a new way just to see if this works. Because sometimes you can actually squeeze it in a towel, which I may end up doing that. But in the meantime, you, know, you, you, you may scowl like, oh my god, he used those gloves to, wa to wash dirty things. But don't tell anybody. I'm going to I'll, I'll wash these off first, make sure they're clean, and then I'm just going to squeeze that down. Let's see if my new invention works. So we'll make sure that my gloves are just as clean as anyone has. We'll even use a little soap. Squeeze all that water out. Ooh, that is a little hot. I want to cool down a little bit. I can even cool down this way. There we go. But it's fun. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Check that out. We've got that one used to be one giant head of cabbage, and now you know, it's relatively small. And we have to decide how much to use. So let's take a look at our bowl. I'm gonna use probably about maybe the same amount or a little less than the chicken. Some fresh ground pepper. Put that in. And maybe a little sesame oil. Little bit. And maybe some soy sauce. Again, I can't read it, but that's soy sauce. A little bit. Okay, let's mix this up and see what it how it turns out. Oh, it's looking good. Gonna be some good gyoza or wonton. Alright, we're ready to wrap the gyoza. Okay, are you ready? This is the exciting part. You take the wonton. Okay, you might want to get close up to the hand here. So you put it in your hand, you take about that much filling, and then you take your washed finger. Make sure that's all cornstarch all mixed up in there. And you do two sides. Then you fold over the other sides to connect. So you got sort of a little triangle. And then you do the front of this side and the back of this side. Pull down and connect them. And there you have a nice little boat shaped gyoza. Alright, so we've got a nice plate of uh, gyoza ready to go and uh, somebody heat up the pan and I usually put the oil in first and I'm not going to deep fry it, I'm just going to pan fry it, but I'm still going to use a little bit of olive oil. I don't know if that's the best one, but it's, it's the one I've got around. And I'm going to kind of use a lot. That should be good. It's enough to cover up the whole bottom. Maybe that's more than I need, but we'll turn it on and I usually, I don't know if that means anything, but I usually put my, my flame on 3. You know, if, if you've got a Marshall lamp, you want to put it on 11, but for my flame I put it on 3. And now you have to wait for it to get hot. And I actually heat it up a little bit in advance, but I, uh, the way I can tell it's hot is when the oil starts to kind of move on its own. So I'm going to sit here and watch the oil. We've got nice hot oil, and I'm going to put these in here one at a time. Oh, I can see the oil get nice and bubbly. There we go. So get, they're going to get a little brown, but I want to get them even, so I'm going to move them around a little bit. Oh, oh, oh they're cooking well already. Well, Hashi, you're so good for cooking. I don't know whatever I did without these. Even amount of golden brownness. Oh, it's starting to look good. The oil gets around evenly. Okay, almost ready for the steaming. And then go get it ready and go. And that's gonna steam the gyoza to the cook all the way through. And it's just sort of exciting. It makes a loud noise, and and that's uh, you know the that's the uh, explosive part of our gyoza cooking.
and I don't know exactly, oh, oh, it's talking to me. I don't know exactly how long to let it go, maybe, well, maybe another 30 seconds or a minute just to make sure it's cooked all the way through. But it's hot in there, there's a lot of steam floating around. All right, I'm feeling good about this now. I'm gonna turn my heat off, get some uh, protection. Slowly, I'm gonna open it up away from me, because if I, if I lift it this way, all the steam's gonna come to my face. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push away. Some of the water from the lid drip down. There we go. Oh, oh this is great. Special Gilbert family style. Okay, it's time to make some sauce, and I'm just going to guess at how much to use of each thing. But I think I'm going to begin with the, uh, the shoyu. Soy sauce. In there, oh my god, a little bit of vinegar. Now, this is a big bottle, so I'm gonna be very careful. I, I like vinegar, but a little more. Ah, there we go. And some ayu, a little bit of spice. Okay, there's some nice sauce. We'll bring it over to our table. Itadakimasu. And let's see, I always, they all look good, but I'm going to pick my favorite one out of all these gyoza, my absolute favorite. <laughs> they look good. I think I'm going to have, which one is the most golden brown? There we go. So here's the gyoza, ready to go. I think it's cooled down enough where I can eat it without burning my tongue off. Dip it in the sauce, and here we go. Itadakimasu. <laughs> what is it? Well, there you have it. Some delicious gyoza, and uh, mm, squishy karai. I put a lot, a lot of layu in there, but I like that. Wash it down with some water. So uh, everybody's got their own method. That's mine. That's the Gilbert family me method of making gyoza. And uh, try it at home. And uh, when you're done, rubber gloves to clean it up. Keep your calluses ready for some vibrato. All right. Thank you. Well, when you make something in your kitchen, you do have to clean up afterwards. And I've learned an amazing lesson if you're a guitar player. Which is that if you if you wash dishes and you get your hands wet, your calluses get all soft. And calluses are extremely important to me because I got to bend the strings all the time. That's how I get vibrato. So I've discovered the magic of black rubber gloves, and man, I love these things. You can uh, plus you can wash dishes with really hot water, and you don't burn your hands. So once once I'm done, I just put on the rubber gloves, toss my my oranges away, and everything's ready to be cleaned, and my calluses stay nice and dry, and life is good. I can, I can dream about bending, bending those notes without soft calluses, nice hard, hard calluses, and clean dishes at the same time, so kind of multitasking with that thing. In fact, even um, many times when I'm preparing for my day of rock and roll, I actually, uh, I was watching my dentist, and he wears gloves. There's thinner ones than this, but I wear those too when I take a shower. That way I can keep my uh, my hands dry. And of course I do wash my hands once in a while, but just I don't want to soak them. You soak your, uh, your calluses, you go away and you can't bend the strings anymore. And uh, whammy bar doesn't count. You can get some good stuff with a whammy, but it's just not the same. You're bending with your fingers. So, oh, thank you. Black gloves, we're ready for the next event. And our hands are nice and 